lifting up Jesus and opening his word from Australia, Denmark, Israel, Japan, New Zealand, Northern Ireland, Republic of Ireland, Singapore, South Africa, United Kingdom, Thailand, the Philippines, the United States, and throughout the world. You're watching Morial TV. Again, look with me, please, to Acts chapter 16 once again. Verse 6, when they passed through the Phrygian and Galatian region, having been forbidden by the Holy Spirit to speak the word in Asia, and in verse 7, when they come to Mysia, they were trying to go into Bithynia, and the Spirit of Jesus did not permit them. There is a question every young believer will have. A question every young believer will have. There's never been a young believer who has not had this question. All the believers, every one of them, will likely at some point be asked this question by a younger believer. So it is a question that young believers will have and that older believers should know how to answer. A question that every young believer will have and that every older believer should know how to answer, particularly if you're a parent or something like that. The question is simply this one. How do you discern, how do you know the Lord's leading in a situation? When you have to make a major decision, how do you know, how do you discern, how do you arrive at determining what the Lord's leading is? Every young believer will have that question, and every older believer will have to ask it. So if you're a young believer, we're going to try to answer the question. If you're an older believer, you may kind of know for yourself, but we want to package it in such a way that you can answer it for other people. It's very practical, very simple, isn't it? Simple question. There's nobody who's not had this question as a young believer. How do we know how to decide God's will when we have to make a decision, particularly an important decision? One of the things I like being about a believer is this. No matter how complicated a situation is, no matter how complex, no matter how many variables, no matter how many factors have to be taken into consideration, we can always reduce things to one simple question. Lord, what is your will at this time? This is not to say all the various factors shouldn't be weighed and considered carefully. They should be. But the bottom line is, Lord, what is your will? Now that's a very comforting thing in itself. Life can be complicated. When it gets complicated, know first of all that everything comes down to one simple question. Second thing is this. We are promised in Proverbs, commit your work to the Lord, your plans will be established. The first prerequisite we have to understand in discerning the Lord's will is that the real issue is not finding what his will is. The real issue is being determined to do it. It's relatively easy for God to show us his will. It may not be so easy to get us to be willing to do it. <laughs> Commit your work to the Lord, your plans will be established. Okay. Now, let's go further. The biggest decision somebody will ever make is to become a Christian, a saved Christian, a born-again Christian. That's the biggest decision in life. 
I assume that most of you are born again Christians and you've already made the biggest decision. So although you may face some other vital decisions in your life, marriage, career, surgery, who knows, moving house, although you may make some other decisions that are vital, they will not be as vital as the decision you've already made. You've already made the biggest and most important decision there is, and you made the correct one. <laughs> that is a source of encouragement in itself. There's no decision you're ever going to have to make that's going to be more important or of any more consequence than the decision you've already made. <sighs> now that's, that's good to know. <laughs> I mean, we know it, but it's good to know we know it. So, how do we discern God's will? First and foremostly, there is the calibrator. A calibrator is an instrument you use to measure how other instruments are functioning. A calibrator is an instrument you use to measure how other instruments are functioning. There are a number of indicators in discerning the will and leading of the Lord when we face a decision. But the first is the calibrator. The calibrator is that indicator by which we test the other indicators. It is the exegetical doctrine of Scripture. The exegetical doctrine of Scripture. Asegesis is wrong. It's reading something into the Bible, not in there. Exegesis is taking out what God did put in there. The Holy Spirit will never lead any of us to do something contrary to the objective teaching of God's Word, arrived at exegetically. I had a guy some months ago, nice guy, call me up, inherited some money and built a recording studio, and said, how you doing and so forth, praise the Lord, terrific, etc. I'd like to do some volunteer work for your ministry. I've got this recording studio I built with an inheritance. I said, that's wonderful. He said, there's one thing, though, as we chatted, because I hadn't seen him in a while. You know, I'm divorced now, and the Lord has brought this other woman into my life. We're living together, but we are planning to get married, only she's not a Christian yet. <laughs> Whoever brought her into your life, it was not the Lord. You don't cohabitate out of holy wedlock, and you don't certainly marry a non-believer if you are a believer. The Lord did not bring her into your life. If he did, it's only because he wanted you to witness to her and tell her the gospel, not to shack up with her and fornicate. The Holy Spirit will never lead any of us to do anything contrary to the objective, doctrinal, and moral teaching of God's Word. We test every other indicator with the indicator of Scripture. Once we have a doctrinal premise governing our conduct, moral values, beliefs, then we can proceed. But unless someone is well-grounded in Scripture, they are not in a position to make a major decision. <laughs> Secondly, we are told in Proverbs that there is 
safety in an abundance of counselors. Not safety in a counselor, safety in an abundance of counselors. Let's look at what a counselor is, but before we look at what a counselor is, let's begin by looking at what a counselor is not. A counselor is not a new believer. It's not somebody who's been saved one or two years. It's an older brother or sister in the Lord who's been around the block a few times. Who's been through trials, faced up to temptations, been through wilderness experience, endured the valleys of life, more experienced in their faith, more knowledgeable in the word, or at least as knowledgeable and experienced as we are. It is not a new believer. Secondly, a counselor is not somebody going to charge you 45 pounds an hour. Again, Christian psychology is an oxymoron. Emphasize the moron. <laughs> Thirdly, telephone, telegraph, tell a woman. <laughs> a counselor is not somebody with a big mouth. A counselor is somebody who knows how to keep their mouths shut and will not tell your affairs to anyone without your prior consent. Fourthly, a counselor is not somebody who goes around volunteering to give advice all the time. People who run around telling other people how to live their lives are inevitably people who do not know how to manage their own. Remember, the first time David went into the valley of Rephaim, God said, go up. The second time he went up in the same valley, in the, in the, in the valley of Rensari, uh, Rephaim, against the Philistines, God said, don't go up. Because God leads you one time in one situation to do one thing. Do not automatically assume it's his will for you to do the same thing the next time in the same situation. Neither assume because that's the way he worked in your life. It's the way he wants to meet the need in somebody else's life. Don't make those kinds of assumptions. But a real counselor would already know that. That's what a counselor is not. God can speak even to unsaved parents up to a point, but so can the devil. More so, however, God can speak through believing parents. God can speak to a pastor and his wife. But when you get counsel, there's not safety in a counselor. There is safety in an abundance of counselors. If you are facing a major decision and you ask a number of people of proven wisdom and experience to pray, and after praying, they all come back to you, telling you the same thing. They're all saying the same thing. That is an indicator. Okay. If a number of godly people of proven wisdom and experience are telling you the same thing that is an indicator not the definitive indicator but it is an indicator it's like anything else 
It's like getting a variety of legal opinions, or a variety of medical opinions, or a variety of scientific opinions. If they're all saying the same thing, it's an indicator. As long as you're asking the right kind of people who know what they're doing and what they're talking about. Thirdly, there is the doctrine of Scripture, but there is also what we might call principles of Scripture. The greatest of these is love. Love of the brethren, love of the lost. All things are lawful. Not all things are helpful. It is perfectly lawful for me to eat shrimp. The law of Moses is fulfilled in Yeshua the Messiah. Paul says it is rendered katargeo in Greek, inoperative. There's no high priesthood, there's no blood sacrifice, and the temple's rebuilt, it'll be the Antichrist. It's fulfilled in the Messiah. The law of Moses is inoperative. You have to keep all of it, or you can't, well, you're not keeping any of it, James says. It is katargeo. Perfectly law lawful for me to eat shrimp, the law is fulfilled in the Messiah. Well, although it is perfectly lawful for me to eat shrimp, my family are Jewish, Israelis. I'm an evangelist to Jewish people. Lawful it is, but it is not helpful. It may be perfectly lawful if you lived in a Celtic culture as opposed to an English one. In Wales or Scotland or Ireland, a pub is not what it is in England. A pub is the social place, kind of a restaurant, eating place type of thing. In Celtic cultures, <coughs> pubs tend to be a legalized form of drug abuse. Alcohol is not a beverage to them. It is a drug. It may be perfectly awful to go into a pub in Ireland or Scotland or Wales. But in my view, it is not helpful. The issue for me is not alcohol. I never was an alcoholic. I didn't have time for the minor vices. <laughs> the issue for me is <clears throat> not putting a stumbling block before another brother or sister who may have had an alcohol problem before they were saved, or not injuring my testimony to an unsaved person who's an alcohol abuser. That's the issue to me. Alcohol to me is neither here nor there. I don't care about it. It means nothing to me one way or another. Lawful and helpful. That is a principle. Well. It's lawful, it's permissible, but that doesn't mean it's helpful. The principle is love, putting the good of others before our own, putting the interests of other people before our own personal freedom, taking into account the repercussions for others on our choices. That is a principle. That also is an indicator. Thirdly, Paul writes, our faith is reasonable. This is not to say our beliefs in the gospel of Jesus is an intellectual faith. It is not an intellectual faith, but it is intellectually defensible. It's reasonable. Isaiah 118, come let us reason together. Our faith is reasonable. It can be defended with apologetics. It's plausible. It's rational. It is not rational, rational to be a Muslim. Islam is not rational. 
It's not rational to call a pedophile like Muhammad a prophet. It's not rational to do that. It's not rational to believe in a book, the Koran, that confuses Mary, the sister of, Ma of Moses, Miriam, with Mary, the sister of Jesus, who lived 1,300 years later, the mother of Jesus, who lived 1,300 years later. It's not rational to believe in Islam. It's not a rational religion. It's not rational to be a Mormon, to say there's Quakers living on the moon. And the Journal of Discourses of Brigham Young, verse, chapter 7, volume 17. There's Quakers living on the sun. That's what, they, that's what Joseph Smith and Brigham Young taught. It's not a rational religion. Our faith, however, is reasonable. Not human reason, but sanctified human reason. Sanctified human reason. When it is sanctified, our logic is set apart to God's service, but it is subordinated to his word. Sanctified reason. Our faith is not illogical. We have the mind of Christ. God promises us the power of sound mind. Our faith is reasonable, Paul says. He gives us the power of sound mind. We should be able to make rational decisions illuminated by the Holy Spirit. Sanctified reason. Greed is the corruption of ambition. Lust is the corruption of desire. There is something wrong with lust. There is nothing wrong with desire. What do you want to do? Because we desire to do something does not mean it is wrong. Many times in the Bible you'll see the phrase, the way it's translated, do what seems good to you. <laughs> what do you want to do? <coughs> it must be scriptural. It must be well advised. It should not violate the principles of Scripture. That is, it should take the best interest of others into consideration. But God gives us desires, natural ones that have been redeemed. And upon salvation, he gives us new desires. Before you're saved, you might want money because you want money. After you're saved, you might want money because you want to go in the ministry full-time and not take a salary for it. <laughs> you might want to finance some ministry that the Lord has laid on your heart. No, oh, it's ambition. You might want to build a business to finance the ministry. That's ambition. That's not greed. You may be attracted to someone and want to marry them. You have a romantic interest in them. You have a physical attraction to them. That is not necessarily lust. If you marry in Christ. It is desire. What do you want to do? God works through our desires both natural ones consecrated to the Lord and also the new ones that he gives us upon salvation. 
very often he takes the same things that we liked and gives us a new purpose for them after we get saved. He takes the same interest and orientations and things we liked and simply gives us a new goal in pursuing them. It must be subordinated, same as human reason, it must be subordinated to Scripture. But God does speak to our desires. Desire is not wrong. Lust is wrong. Ambition is not wrong. Greed is wrong. Covetousness is wrong. Desiring that which belongs to another. That's wrong. Not desiring what God has for you. Desiring what God has for you is not coveting. The only thing we're told to covet in the New Testament is the prayers. We can covet the prayers of other believers. I covet your prayers, that's it. I don't covet your goods, your money, your wife, your car, but I can covet your prayers. That will not be covered. It's the only kind of coverage that God sanctions. Now, let's look. Next indicator. Charismata, from the Greek charism. I said charismata, not charismania. Again, you've heard me point out, you see these connivers running around. Yes, my daughter, I would say unto thee, the Lord has given me a picture to you. Yes, my brother, I would say to you, the Lord has shown me. That is not prophecy, that is clairvoyance. These are just shysters. That is not charismata. That is charismania cum con artistry. But the spirit of Jesus did not permit them. The Lord can speak to us through charismatic means, words of knowledge, prophecies, and interpreted tongue, whatever. They are an indicator. There are those who have argued that these things ended with the apostles. This is complete nonsense. Turn with me, please, to 1 Corinthians chapter 1. <coughs> Verse 7. So that you are not lacking in any charism, same words used in chapters 12 through 14 for spiritual gifts. That you are not lacking in any charism awaiting for the revelation, the perusia of our Lord Jesus Christ. These charismatic gifts are to last until he comes. An epistle is a letter. You cannot take one sentence somebody writes in a letter out of the overall context of the letter and say that was their intention. This is in the first chapter. Of course, there's no chapter division of the original Greek, but it's in the beginning of the letter. In the preface and in the opening sentences of a letter, it sets the stage and tone and theme for the rest of the things going to be addressed in the letter further on. So the apostles highlights the issues they're going to touch on in the letter. And chapter 1, verse 7 points to what's discussed in chapters 12 through 14 concerning charismatic gifts. The perfect is the return of Christ. It is not the giving of the canon of Scripture. These gifts continue until Jesus comes. Cessationism can be as loony on one extreme as charismania and Kenny and Benny are on the other. It can be just the, the, the cessationist churches are as off the wall on one extreme as Elam is on the other.
However, in chapter 15 of 1 Corinthians, let these prophecies and so forth be tested. The first and foremost test, Scripture, the indicator. How do you test the counsel? Scripture. How do you test if your reasoning is correct? Is it scriptural? How do you weigh your desires on the scale of God's perspective? Scripture. Scripture is the indicator that we test all the other indicators. Now look again at Acts 16. Verse 17, verse 7, sorry, is the Spirit of Jesus. Verse 6 just says the Holy Spirit. You will hear a way, a voice. This is the way walking it. Direct leading. This works different ways, different times for different people. The direct leading of the Holy Spirit. First of all, our faith is not a religion, it is a relationship with God through Christ. When we pray, we speak to God. When we read his word, he speaks back to us. Prayer is a two-way conversation. In a relationship, the more you communicate with somebody, the better you become at recognizing their voice. Your husband, your wife, your mother, your father, your brother, your sister, a close friend. The minute you hear their voice, you pick up the phone, you know it's them. It is no different. The longer you have been a Christian, the more clearly you will be able to discern the voice of the Lord. The more you pray, the clearer you will hear. The more you read, the more you will hear. <laughs> Quite simple. The more you pray, the clearer you will hear. The more you read, the more you will hear. As you get older in the Lord, your hearing should improve. Because the relationship grows, the more you communicate with somebody, the more you know their voice. Well, let's look. This can vary according to the individual, according to their own temperament and persona, according to their gender, according to what their ministry and gifting and calling is, according, according to how long they've been saved. There's no specific. However, there are, again, guidelines. Some people call it a rhema. It's really not what the Greek word rhema means, but some people call it that, even though that's not what it means in Greek. Although the objective exegetical doctrine of Scripture is what comes first, you could be seeking God's guidance for something and reading the Psalms or some other passage of Scripture, and the Holy Spirit can quicken that to your circumstances. Again, people call this a rhema, but that's not what rhema means in Greek. Now, that must be tested by its objective doctrinal meaning, exegetically, you understand. But that's one of the ways God can speak. Sometimes it's just leading. Again, this varies from person to person and can be related to what their gifting and ministry is. Study to show yourself approved. I may have it in my head to speak about something before I come to a meeting. There have been times, even though I have what to speak about, 
I have not had the green light from the Holy Spirit until the second I stand up at the pulpit. It doesn't happen all the time, but it has happened, and it does happen from time to time. There have been times I have been preparing or planning to speak on one thing, and the minute I stood up, the Holy Spirit told me to change it, and four or five people come up to you and say, that was exactly what the Lord wanted me to hear. Though the plans in a man's mind be many, God's purpose will be established. Okay. That's not to demean the importance of preparation and study. Study to show yourself approved. The more you know God's word, the, the more there is to draw on, obviously. And the better you can communicate things. It varies according to your gift according to your age in Christ, but it also varies according to your gender. I've pointed this out before, but I'll go through it again for the sake of the tape and for those with us the first time. Because of the fall of man, men have become insensitive, women have become hypersensitive. Because of the fallen nature of man, Men have become insensitive, women have become hypersensitive. If a husband gets saved first, usually, not always, but usually, his wife will become a Christian. Water takes the shape of its container. But if the boots are on the other feet, and the wife gets saved first, there are some very godly women who struggle not for years, but for decades and unhappy marriages because their husbands don't know the Lord. And most of the time, again, not always, but most of the time, it's the wife who gets saved first. There are exceptions. Why is it it's more likely for the wife to get saved first? Because men are insensitive. Women are more sensitive. When a husband and wife pray for direction, it is usually the wife who will hear from the Lord first and clearest. Why? Men are insensitive. Women are more sensitive. It's easier for women to hear the voice of the Holy Spirit through the sensitivity. The fall of man has taken a toll on us, both men and women. It is a foolish husband who does not listen to the counsel of a praying wife. Notice I said a praying wife, not a nagging wife. It is co-equally a foolish husband who does listen to the counsel, if you want to call it that, of a nagging wife. To this day, the conflict in the Middle East between Jew and Arab in large measure goes back to the descendants of Ishmael who went to marry with the descendants of Esau because Sarah nagged Abraham and he listened to her. It's a foolish man who does not listen to a praying wife and weigh her words carefully. It is also a foolish man who does listen to a nagging wife. When women nag, it's out of insecurity or self-will. It is not out of God's leading. Men are reliant on female sensitivity. Men are dependent on female sensitivity. Somebody can't be a pastor if he does not have a wife who prays for him, stands with him, supports him in the ministry. Men are reliant on female sensitivity. On the other hand, as we always point out, anything God intends for good, the world, the flesh, and the devil will corrupt for evil. So while it is easier for women to hear the voice of the Holy Spirit, it is also easier for women to hear the voice of a counterfeit spirit. Women are much more vulnerable to spiritual seduction than men. 
the serpent beguiled the woman. So while men are reliant on female sensitivity, women are reliant on male protection. The husband is the head of the wife, as Christ is the head of the church, not primarily because of bigger musculature, but because of the fallen nature of women. It is a protective authority. My daughter went to law school. She's a lawyer. A Christian woman may be in a high-powered profession like law, medicine, or an executive in a corporation. No problem. But such women need to realize that in the marriage, leadership is male spiritually. It may not be easy to make that kind of an adjustment when you're making big legal or medical or scientific or business decisions. But in the marriage, leadership is going to be male. In the church, leadership is going to be male. I have Maggie Thatcher back personally as a personal opinion. I have her, I have her back at number 10 tomorrow compared to anybody we've had since. She made her mistakes. She perhaps would get too big for her knickers. But at least she wore trousers. Anyone we've had since wears a skirt, in my view. You may disagree. I'm not here to politically editorialize. I'd have Maggie back tomorrow and number 10 compared to anybody you've had since. That's my view. If you disagree, that's fine too. However, even if I was married to Maggie, the husband is the head of the wife as Christ is the head of the church. Women cannot be pastors. They are much more vulnerable to spiritual seduction. Men hear from the Lord in one way, women in another. Women can hear faster, and clearer, but like a hypersensitive antenna, they can also pick up all kinds of static, which confuses the message. You understand what I'm saying? The fall has affected both men and women. Men are reliant on female sensitivity. Women are reliant on male protection. That's it. Direct leading. Now, when all of these things, or several of these things, are in agreement with Scripture, and all seem to be pointing in the same direction, you have a pretty good indication what God is saying. I would, unless it was something directly the Bible says to do or not to do, I would be reluctant to make a major decision on any one of these indicators. You understand? But of all of these indicators are working in harmony, pointing in the same direction you have a pretty good indication of what God is saying. However, we have a fail-safe mechanism. More about the fail-safe mechanism in a moment. But before we look at the fail-safe mechanism, there is another principle we have to understand. All things work together for the better to those who love God and are called according to his purpose. Not all things work for the better. All things work together for the better. We may make a decision that could wind us up in adverse circumstances. Because the circumstances initially appear adverse does not necessarily mean we've made the wrong decision.
in retrospect, we understand differently. True story. Some seminarians in the United States were taking final Greek exams at a seminary. And they were studying the Aris tense and all this stuff. And they were studying hours to take this final Greek exam so they could graduate. And they decided they would take a break and go out and play basketball for one hour just to stretch their muscles and get up from the tables. Give their eyes a rest, stretch their muscles, and then they'd come back and resume their studies after taking a one hour break to play basketball just to stretch out a bit. They'd been at it for some hours. And while playing basketball, one guy accidentally knocked his friend over, <laughs> dislocated the patella of his, of his kneecap, and instead of his knee going this way, his friend's knee went the other way. <laughs> that must have hurt. <laughs> oh no, what did I do? Couldn't take the exam. Not only that, he wound up in a cast for months and it was awful. What did I do to my friend? He felt terrible. Did we sin by playing basketball? We should have prayed about it and sought the Lord's leading. <laughs> All this stuff. I suppose things like that will go through anybody's head under those circumstances. I don't know. But they found something. They found a very dangerous thrombosis that could have easily gone mobile the femoral blood vessel, came an embolism, and knocked the dude off. They only found it because of the x-rays he did on his leg. They saw something swelling. There was no MRI scans in those days, no soft, soft tissue scan, but they found some pathology on the x-ray that made them look for something. Did a blood chemistry put him on heparin immediately, anticoagulants, and it was so bad they had to do an operation called the sympathectomy. Rare for such a thing to happen in a young person, it usually happens in older people, but it can happen in younger people. They found the thing, the guy is alive and well and still in the ministry. Had he not gotten knocked over, he wouldn't be in the ministry, he'd be in the cemetery. No, all things do not work for the better. But all things do work together for the better. Now let's understand the stale safe mechanism. If everything seems to be leading in one direction, all those things, or the majority of those things, line up with Scripture, the counsel you're getting, the prophecies you're getting, what you believe the Lord is saying to you? Don't let these things color, be colored by your desires, but don't deny your desires either. There's a balance. You can make the decision with one certainty. We have a fail-safe mechanism. Something that makes sure we don't mess up and make the wrong decision. What is it? Again, commit your work to the Lord. Your plans will be established. Turn with me to the book of Revelation, chapter 3, please. 
Now, this has a specific meaning, of course, to the Church of Philadelphia in the first century, end of the first century, but it is a general truth. It tells us something about the nature of Jesus and his lordship. Verse 7 of Revelation 3, to the end of the church in Philadelphia, or Nottingham or River, he was holy, who was true, who has the key of David. Now remember the key of David, the key, the king's key, the royal key, the regal key, Jesus has it, not the Pope. Popes have actually claimed to have this key and forced nations to go to war, threatening to, to, to pronounce papal anathemas against emperors. If you don't invade France or something, they actually made countries go to war. But the Pope doesn't have this key. Jesus does. He who was holy, who was true, who has the key of David, who opens and no one will shut, who shuts and no one opens, says this. I know your deeds. I put before you an open door, which no one can shut. It reiterates it. Because you have little power, kept my word, not denied my name, etc. Can Satan open doors? Yes. But he cannot open a door that Christ is shut. Can Satan shut a door? Paul tells us that. In First Thessalonians, I desired to come to you, but Satan hindered us. Satan can shut doors. But he cannot shut a door Christ has opened. Satan cannot open a door that Christ has shut, and he cannot shut a door that Christ has opened. The fail-safe mechanism is Providencia Divina. What does that sound like? Divine Providence. When the Lord providentially intervenes in the affairs of men and women. Lord is the Lord of history, it says in Daniel. He establishes kings and removes kings. He may do it through angelic agency. He may do it through some other means. But we can be sure that when Jesus opens, nobody's going to close it. And when he closes, nobody opens. He has got that key, and he hasn't given it to anybody, much less the Pope. Or any other faker who pretends to have it. This comes first. Alpha. This comes last. Omega. When everything seems to line up, Lord, I'm going to do this, but if it's not your will, please show me. Close the door. Let something happen. Lord, I'm not going to do this. It doesn't seem right. I thought it was, but it doesn't. But if I'm wrong, you open it. Let no one close it. When he opens, nobody closes. When he closes, nobody opens. That is the fail-safe mechanism. Again, be reluctant to make a major decision based on any one of these things except Alpha. Forget Alpha. That can be misunderstood in Britain. We'll use the Hebrew. Aleph. And Tav. <laughs> The Alpha and Omega is the olive and palm in Hebrew. Does anybody not understand? When the Lord is saying something, remember, he may have many mouths but one voice. 
all this stuff is pointing in the same direction. It's all working in harmony. Now, I'm not saying the devil can't counterfeit it or get in or confuse it. That's why it doesn't say the safety in a counselor, but in an abundance of them. That's why I'm not saying that any one of these things is what you should do. Somebody gave me a prophecy, that's it. It all works together. But remember, we have the fail-safe mechanism. Commit your work to the Lord. Your plans will be established. The real issue is not finding his will. That's the Holy Spirit's job. God will show us his will. In his way and in his time, he will show us his will. The real issue is always our willingness to do it. And trust him. If something goes wrong, when you know you are in God's will, you will only understand it in retrospect. All things work together for the better. However, if you get out of God's will and things go wrong, that is his correction. Not his condemnation. He is not interested in condemning us. He condemned his own son on our behalf to crucifixion. The condemnation is finished for Christians. When we goof up, when we mess up, when we get it wrong, he's not interested in condemning us. He's interested in getting us back on the right road. You understand? Then, providentially, things may become adverse. if we make an honest mistake. But if we understand these guidelines of Scripture, we're not likely to make those kind of mistakes and big decisions. Now, anybody can get something wrong once in a while. Anybody can make a wrong decision. Even the most godly of people can do something wrong. In the Bible, we saw, even in the New Testament, we saw some people get some things wrong. Nobody's saying that can't happen. But if it does get wrong, when we seek the Lord, we'll find a way to get it right. If you are a young believer, I can only tell you what the Bible says. Hearing the voice of Jesus by learning to talk to him and hearing his voice when he talks back to you, that's between you and him. <laughs> I can only tell you how the phone works. I can't tell you when to dial a number. That's for you. It's something you're going to grow into. The longer you're saved, the more you walk with the Lord, the more you pray, the more you're experienced in ministry, the less of an issue this is going to become. But every young believer is going to have these questions. And if you are an older believer, although you may know these things, bear in mind, a younger believer doesn't. And at some point, they're going to ask you. You have to know how to answer. Now, there's more to it than this. But in essence, this is the way it works. God bless. Thank you for joining us. My thanks to Vima and the brethren and the ladies in the kitchen. They've been wonderful today, haven't they? They've always been. Again, we have future meetings. The agenda for next year is up here if you didn't see it. Uh, I'll leave the tapes and book table open for a few moments. 
If you just wait a minute, we'll do the benediction and then we'll let you go wherever you're going to. Then the Lord spoke to Moses, saying, Speak to Aaron and to his son, saying, Thus you shall bless the sons of Israel and say to them, The Lord bless you and keep you. The Lord make his face shine upon you and be gracious to you. The Lord lift up his countenance upon you and grant you peace. So they shall invoke my name on the sons of Israel. And then I will bless them. Yibrecha Adonai v'yishmerecha, Yeh Adonai panav v'lecha v'yechunecha, Yisa Adonai panav v'lecha v'yaseh lecha shalom. B'shem Yeshua HaMashiach, Shabbat Shalom.